Hi Genetic Innovations students, welcome to section 2 on recombinant DNA technology. In the section on recombinant DNA technology, our learning objectives are to describe how restriction enzymes are used as tools in molecular biology, to describe and interpret how restriction fragment length polymorphisms are used in genotyping and variation analysis, to illustrate the process of molecular cloning, and describe how and why the technique is used, then to analyze vector maps and predict the results of various restriction digestion combinations, to interpret and construct restriction maps from given data. In this lecture, we'll be focusing on the first learning objective, which is to describe how restriction enzymes are used as tools in molecular biology. So recombinant DNA technology involves combining DNA fragments from different sources that are not usually found together in nature. So we copy and paste different strands or segments of DNA together, and this fragment is called a recombinant DNA fragment. So in order to understand recombinant DNA technology, we first need to understand what's a clone. In terms of molecular biology, in this case, we're referring to a cloned copy of DNA, and this copied DNA fragment can either be a linear fragment or a circular fragment of DNA. And recombinant DNA is a cloned DNA fragment, which is usually a recombinant fragment. And the reason that we clone these recombinant fragments is to study the structure of genes or certain DNA sequences. So as I mentioned, that recombination involves copying and pasting different forms of DNA or strands of DNA from different species or organisms together. So we want to cleave the DNA from one source and then copy it into or ligate it with another fragment of DNA. And this involves firstly cutting the DNA with something called a restriction enzyme. We use restriction enzymes because they are endonucleases. Endonucleases are enzymes that cleave in the middle of a DNA sequence. We also have other enzymes that can manipulate DNA and cleave the end of the DNA sequence, and these are called exonucleases. So if you have a linear strand of DNA, an endonuclease is capable of cleaving that strand in the center of that sequence, whereas an exonuclease can only cleave from the, from the out, outer ends of that strand of DNA. Restriction enzymes, as I mentioned, are endonucleases, and they can also cleave DNA at very specific sites. We'll also be interested in looking at another enzyme, but we'll discuss this later on, and this is a DNA ligase. A DNA ligase is an enzyme that can join two ends of DNA, and these can be cohesive ends of DNA or blunt ends. So we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail further and DNA ligases are ATP-dependent enzymes. So recombinant DNA technology is used to isolate, replicate, and analyze genes by combining fragments of DNA from different sources, copying those fragments, and then look at the structure of the genes or regions of DNA that have been copied. So let's discuss a little bit about how restriction enzymes were first discovered. It was in the 1950s that scientists first began to notice that bacteriophages, which are viruses that affect bacteria, were only able to grow in certain bacterial host strains. This was called host-controlled variation, and it was explained to occur due to the presence of restriction enzymes. It was in 1978 that Werner Arbor, Hamilton Smith, and Daniel Nathans first won the Nobel Prize in Medicine for their discovery of restriction enzymes. These three scientists really did some pioneering work on restriction enzymes. They were working with a virus called SV40, and they discovered that the bacteria that SV40 were trying to infect encoded a restriction factor. They called it a restriction factor back then, and they named this endonuclease R. And they found that bacterial hosts that contained endonuclease R prevented bacteriophages from growing in them. They also saw that endonuclease R specifically cut bacteriophage DNA, but not bacterial DNA. And it cleaved the bacterial DNA into fragments of specific 
and consistent length. So each time that the bacterial host was infected with SV40, it would cleave the DNA into fragments of the same size and specific size consistently. So when these scientists discovered that the bacterial host could cleave SV40 DNA into fragments of specific size each time, they realized that the endonuclease from the bacterial host would be quite useful to draw a map of SV40 DNA and its genes. And so they isolated this endonuclease R and used it to map the genes in SV40 DNA. And not long after that, scientists soon started investigating and have found and discovered many, many more restriction enzymes. And these have now been developed into very useful tools in molecular biology. How do restriction enzymes work? These enzymes work by shape-to-shape -shape matching, which means that they can recognize a specific part of DNA or what we call a recognition site. The restriction enzyme is able to wrap around a certain region of DNA and cleave both strands of the DNA molecule. These recognition sites are usually between four and eight base pairs in length. And restriction enzyme sequences are usually palindromic. So here's an example of palindromic sequences, A, G, C, T, or G, G, A, T, C, C. And I'll explain how palindromes work now. So a palindromic sequence is symmetrical because it reads the same in the five to three prime direction on both strands. So if we look at this fragment of DNA containing a restriction enzyme recognition site in the middle, G, G, A, T, C, C, if we read it on the sense strand in the 5 to 3 prime direction and on the anti-sense strand in the 5 to 3 prime direction, we see GGATCC in both directions. And why is this important? So these sequences, they're symmetrical because they read the same on both the 5 to 3 prime direction on both strands, but they also have a property called twofold rotational symmetry which means that this enzyme can fold back upon itself and form another secondary structure within a strand of DNA. We call this a cruciform structure because if we look at the sequence, if we look at the AT, GC, and CC, it can actually fold out and form what is called a palindrome. So it's a folded out little sequence that forms this cruciform structure. And these structures are what can be recognized by restriction enzymes, as the restriction enzymes can very easily bind to these modified secondary structures of the DNA. Restriction enzymes cleave both strands of DNA at the same position within the restriction site on the DNA strand. The restriction enzyme can leave either blunt ends or sticky ends. So if the restriction enzyme cleaves the strand of DNA at the center of the re recognition site, so if it cleaved directly down the middle, it would cleave in the same position on both strands. That would leave no overhangs. So it would cleave blunt, so you'd have double-stranded DNA on either side. But if it were to cleave unequally, or if it were to cleave in a position that's not in the center of the restriction site, it would cleave at the same position on both strands, so after the first G in this case, and it would cleave after the first G in the five to three prime direction on both strands, what we'd end up with is a little bit of an overhang here. And we call this a sticky end or a cohesive overhang. Now I've mentioned that there are multiple different restriction enzymes that have been isolated from various bacterial species. And here's an example. These restriction enzymes are also named from the bacterial host that they were isolated. So HEND3 was isolated from the bacterium Haemophilus influenzae, BAMH1 from Bacillus, SAR3A from Staphylococcus aureus, ALU1 from Arthrobacter luteus. And each of these restriction enzymes have uh, different recognition sites. As you can see, they are varied, AAGCTT, GGATCC, GATC, AGCT, all of these sequences are palindromes. And depending on the position at which the restriction enzyme cleaves, we'd have either sticky overhangs, either sticky overhangs, 
or blunt ends. And these sticky overhangs are actually quite useful because we can use them in molecular biology to re-ligate the sequence or to ligate it to another sequence which has a similar overhang. And we'll discuss that a bit more in detail when we talk about molecular cloning. So to date, approximately 3,000 restriction enzymes have been discovered, and these recognize more than 230 DNA sequences. These enzymes have been developed into useful tools, and that's because they cleave DNA at specific and known sites. The ones that we are interested in are the type 2 restriction enzymes because they cleave at defined positions very close to or within the recognition sequence. But we also have other types of restriction enzymes that can also be used. Type 1 restriction enzymes cleave at random sites approximately 1,000 base pairs away from the recognition sequence. Then we also have type 3 restriction enzymes which cleave outside the recognition sequence. And these enzymes require two sequences in opposite orientations within the same DNA strand. And then we have type 2 G restriction enzymes, which have both re restriction endonuclease and methyl transferase activity. Type 2 P, which cleaves symmetric targets and cleavage sites. Type 2 S, which can recognize asymmetric sequences. And type 4 that can cleave mod modified DNA, such as methylated DNA. So restriction enzymes can be used in multiple techniques such as genome mapping by restriction fragment length polymorphisms as well as molecular cloning. And these are the two techniques that we'll now be discussing in a little bit more detail in upcoming lessons. Thank you.